Eh, there we go. You outnumber me in paddles, Kim. I just realized this. You got me beat. Well, um, <clears throat> that's some really special paddles. Mm. I don't use any of them. Oh. Anymore. I did use one of them, and one's from Honduras. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's made out of mahogany. Okay. Okay. Good to know. I brought, I brought it back with me after a medical dental trip. And I actually paddled a long mahogany 20 foot canoe, um, 25 foot canoe, something like maybe it's 30. It was really cool. That's rather incredible. All right, we're waiting for the last folks to get in here. We'll start here in just a minute here. We can see the participant numbers slowly. Okay. Up. Um, we don't want to get too far into it before everybody's online. You know, want to make sure folks are in here. Uh, but we can get started. Uh, welcome to the second evening session of the Friends of the Boundary Waters Annual Gathering. Today, it's about the people. This is about the people and their experiences with the Boundary Waters. So I'm Mike Linneman. I am the Development and Membership Director for the Friends of the Boundary Waters. And if you don't know who the Friends are, we're a charitable nonprofit around since 1976. And our mission is to do three things. We protect it, we preserve it, and we restore the wilderness character of the Boundary Waters and the surrounding ecosystem from Quetico to Lake Superior, just as a moose would walk across borders, we work on the whole ecosystem wide protection. So our vision is for the future of this treasure lies at the intersection of people, communities, and wilderness. Again, reiterated tonight, it's about the people. Tonight's evening uh, of the people is sponsored by Robbins Kaplan and Bad Weather Brewing. You can see our whole listing of all of the events here coming up. We're on day two, Wednesday the 16th. Thank you to all our other sponsors here. We really appreciate all the support to make this free for everybody. That's why you may have wondered, well, why is your annual gallery free this year? That's why, sponsors, I always thank you. I have Quetico Kim with me, Kim Young, and a little visit from Kate Sedoti. We'll see that in a little bit. And I wanna go over some basic information for you tonight about making great meals in the Boundary Waters. So if you questions, which I hope you do, please put them in the Q&A uh, little tab. If you take your mouse cursor, go to the bottom and click on the Q&A, you'll see this whole thing that says open, answered, dismissed. It'll be that whole thing. Pop a question in there if you have one, if you want to get some clarification. Kim will have uh, some time at the end where we'll go over them. I've got a couple ones too that I want to know about, trust me. And in the chat, if you have any clarifying things for any of us uh, that are speaking, like myself or Kim, that, you know, could be maybe not as public, let us know on that too. This is being recorded in case you can't jot down quick enough things that she's talking about. Uh, we're going to have that up there probably a few days to a week on our website that you can recheck out. Really keep beer before your trip, you can recheck in. So without further ado, welcome Kim and... Everybody else, have a great time enjoying making great meals in the laundry waters. Thanks, Mike. Hi, I'm Jenny Anderson of Girl of 10,000 Lakes. I'm an outdoor blogger here in Minnesota, and I first fell in love with the Boundary Waters about five years ago. It was just after my husband and I had gotten engaged, so we decided to celebrate by doing a Boundary Waters trip, and there's nothing like uh, canoe camping, you know, packing your gear, portaging, surviving the wilderness with your significant other to put your relationship to the test. So I'm happy to report we came out uh, stronger than before. And I just remember getting hooked the first time when I was lake trout fishing. Um, in the Boundary Waters, you just never know what size lake trout you'll get. But the when I was fishing, we caught this massive laker. It was a workout just to reel it in. And after reeling it in, we, you know, prepared it, uh, cleaned it. We marinated with lemon and butter and capers, salt and pepper, put it in some foil and threw it into the coals in our campfire. And uh, we basically baked it in there for a while. And I was just so surprised when the bones just fell out of there um, after it was cooked. It was so much meat, so much protein for just the two of us. And I was just astounded by the kind of eating that you can experience in the Boundary Waters. And now we have a one-year-old son named Harlan, and he's already been to the Boundary Waters. Uh, when he was four months old, we were 
um, out there off the Gunflint Trail and just had a great time day paddling. And you can find some of my photos from our adventures on my Instagram. It's at girl of 10,000 lakes. And I also have an article about how families with little ones can do the boundary waters the easy way. And that's at girl of 10,000 lakes.com. And now I'm excited to introduce Kim Young, better known as Quetico Kim. Uh, Kim is an expert in all things Quetico Provincial Park. She's been there canoe camping since the 70s. Um, she's been a contributor for the Boundary Waters Journal on the Quetico Provincial Park in particular. And if you ever need some advice on hyperlight packing, whether it's catching fish or finding blueberries to cut down on some of that weight, Kim is your go-to expert. Kim? Well, thank you, Jenny. I'm really happy to talk to you tonight about making great meals in the Boundary Waters. And this is our second evening, as Mike had said, um, of presentations for the annual gathering this year. So I was, in, I was last in the Boundary Waters just this past August. I spent four nights on Knife Lake and one night on Birch with some friends and we even visited Dorothy Moulter's islands and we visited the Ribbon Rock. We were channeling her strength and her resilience. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. So I've been canoe camping since 1977 and that is 43 years this summer. I can't believe it, it's gone by pretty fast. Cooking good camping food requires a bit of planning, but it's really worth it. The constant paddling and the energy expended on portages equals a healthy wilderness appetite. So do you spend extra time in camp to prepare a meal or do you grab a protein bar to go? Let's get started. No matter whether you leave for three days or two weeks, basic cooking equipment remains more or less the same. So here's the list of the basics that you'll need. And I'm not going to read the whole list, but I'm going to highlight a few. A good stove and a cook kit are very, very important. I'm probably on my fifth or sixth cook kit and I'm on my third stove, which I've settled on. I really love it. It's a Snow Peak 2.0 gigapower stove and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that later. Another thing that's really important, if you go to the Quetico, there aren't any fire grates. Notice this picture, there's a beautiful fire grate. This is on Hudson Lake on the island campsite. There aren't any fire grates in Quetico, so you have to bring your own. And don't forget a water filter, as you're gonna to want to use filtered water in most of your recipes. And a small plastic tablecloth, I use a green one, is really, really handy at your campsite and on day trips. A few things that really make a big difference on how much food to buy is like how many people are going on your trip and what kind of eaters are they. Younger people and men eat large quantities of food and metabolize it more quickly and I'm sure that's really not even a surprise. Once I was part of a group of eight women and two of them were teenage girls and by the last night we ran out of food. I'd gone out fishing to try to catch some fish and came back in and people were downing the instant oatmeal like this. So we didn't have breakfast for the next day. Uh, we made it, but you know, I just didn't bring enough food. So on the first night, you might want to consider bringing some frozen, frozen or fresh meat along. It's always a nice thing to do on the first night. But then also ask yourself, can you change your meal from cooking over the fire to cooking over the stove in a frying pan? Because you might be on your way up and there might be a fire ban all of a sudden. So you should have some meals that you can cook on the stove. You can always throw in a box or two of macaroni and cheese like we used to do. So on the trip I took just last month, I was one of four women and we're healthy eaters. We were out for four nights and five days. So we chose four dinners and then we chose two extra ones, a fish meal and um, soup. So Breakfast and lunch are basically the same almost every day. We lay it out on the tablecloth and people can have whatever they want except the day that we have pancakes. So here's an interesting list to look at before we go on. I copied this word for word from a book about a trip that two gentlemen took to Algonquin Park. And that is a provincial park over on the east side of Ontario. And I did not know what Clem was. That's the fifth item on the left side there. Well, it's milk spelled backwards. 
get that. I found out that it's powdered milk and it's used at logging camps and it was made in Toronto, Canada. I found an ad for it. So this is quite a different food list from the things that we use nowadays. Imagine bringing four pounds of bacon, uh, four pounds of butter and seven pounds of bacon. So, but there's one thing on the list I do bring that's prunes. I don't bring three pounds though. So after I shop, here's what my dining, look, dining room table looks like. I separate everything into breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then I do all the recycling of all the packages. And that just, you do that because it just takes up space and it also adds a lot of weight. So I put the fresh fruit in Ziplocs and I put that into the refrigerator or the freezer right away. And you'll probably notice I have an egg carton there. So I will cook the eggs at the last minute. We always bring hard boiled eggs. We really like those. I bring salsa. I'll put those in the Nalgene bottles at the last minute. You could also bring fresh eggs if you wanted to. A friend of mine does this where she cracks all the eggs into a Nalgene bottle and she freezes it and then she can use it on the first or second morning. So some of the items do stay in the same original packaging like these hash browns and we're going to talk about these later. All you have to do is add hot water to the carton to rehydrate the potatoes. I love GORP. We always make GORP. I mix it up ahead of time and I give everyone their own Ziploc bag with their name on it so no one can fight over it. I took some of the Zatarain's yellow rice and I marked the package and then I took the instructions and I taped that to the package. So we know exactly what we need to do with that. And then you can see why the bacon box gets recycled. The bacon's in plastic already. And so we just need to get rid of that cardboard. You can make elementary meals like macaroni and cheese, like I mentioned, or you can use a dehydrator, which allows you to bring some hamburger with you. I did try rehydrating, um, dehydrating chicken. Don't try it, just buy it. So you cook the hamburger, you rinse off the fat because it lasts a lot longer if you rinse the fat off. I put mine on a paper towel then and I put it in my dehydrator. And I usually have to put it on anywhere from four to eight hours on high. And then in the lower left corner, you can see how small it gets and how dry it gets and it's very sharp. So I put it in a Ziploc. I used to try to vacuum seal it, but the pointy parts of it would poke through and it wouldn't be sealed anymore. So I just put it in a Ziploc. You can use this cooked and dehydrated hamburger for spaghetti, for tacos, for chili, pizza, and probably many, many other things. So another way that you could um, cook this meat is to boil it in some water and boil it for about 15 minutes. I just found out about that recently. And you could do that too. It's all about getting the fat off. So you really want to rinse the hamburger really, really well. So that dehydrator sort of looks like an old microwave. I actually got that at the Olmsted County Fair in 1977. So I've had that since I started going to the Bonnie Waters. Now I've noticed that I've seen a lot of really nice dehydrators at garage sales lately. The, the round ones, they're clear. Some of them are clear. Some of them are very nice and you can get them for 10 or $20. So if you want to try dehydrating, go to a garage sale and find a dehydrator. Lots of people use vacuum sealers. A vacuum sealer works really good for sauces like this, but you do have to freeze your sauce first in order to make that, make the vacuum sealer work. Some people actually make pre-made meals, they cook them, they seal them, and they bring them up and they either just throw them in boiling water, still in the bag, or sometimes they open up the bag and put them in their, one, and in their pot and have a one pot meal. So a lot of people have all their meals planned already and they're already cooked and they just do it that way. So be sure and repackage all your liquid, liquids in Nalgene bottles and put them in Ziplocs. I always put my homemade syrup in two Ziplocs. It always seems to leak. And then be sure and put them with their respective meal and be sure and label them because if you're the only person that's doing the food, you, you might not remember exactly what's in there and, or if someone else is helping you, they can see what it is. 
So let's move on to breakfasts. So breakfasts have mainly been oatmeal, hard-boiled eggs, pancakes, coffee, tea, English muffins are really nice with some jam and peanut butter. One of the things that we always bring is the pre-made bacon, the pre-cooked bacon, because it tastes really good and it's really, because you're not cooking it for 15 minutes, it limits the amount of bacon smell in camp. So animals don't generally come into camp to, because the bacon smell doesn't last that long. Breakfast bars are another thing that are great for the last morning or if you're going on a day trip and you wanna get going. And then some, you may wanna actually up your game and make some scones in the morning. We'll talk about that a little later. Here's some of our breakfast choices on my green plastic tablecloth. There's instant oatmeal on the lower right, but you could up your game with Bob's Red Mill Muesli, which is really, really good. And when you have large groups, it's a really easy way to make the oatmeal in one pot and then everybody can just take some in their cup. See, there's my prunes, lots of coffee and uh, pancakes and the bacon. It's kind of, it's really fun and colorful to just put it out on your tablecloth instead of just on the ground. So the pre-cooked bacon, you just heat it up in a pan and you set it aside in a container that will keep it warm or you could wrap it in some aluminum foil. I always bring extra aluminum foil. If you're lucky enough, you may have found some blueberries in camp and you could add those to your pancakes. And maybe you caught some walleye in the morning or the night before and you were able to save it and you could cook it up in the morning. So wild blueberry season wasn't very good this year and I knew that ahead of time. So I brought dehydrated blueberries with me and we use those in the pancakes and the scones. When I take a tow, which is not always, but when I go up the Moose Lake chain, I usually take a tow. We need a quick breakfast. So here's our first morning breakfast consisting of homemade muffins made by my friend Kathy, hard boiled eggs and coffee from the outfitter. And the last morning, we had hot couscous with fruit and coffee. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I made this hot couscous in this cozy. So here's some reflectix. And it is, you, it is sold by the foot at the local hardware store. And then we have, I have some aluminum tape in the picture. This Reflectix is like double-sided silver bubble wrap. It's really cool. So you basically take your pot and you take your marker and you fashion a circle and you fashion some sides and use the aluminum tape to tape it all together. And one of the reasons you do this is you would cook your food in your pot a certain amount and then you would turn your pot off and put it in a cozy and it allows you, allows the food to continue to cook without using up any more fuel. Now, I found out about this from a guy named Kevin Outdoors. He's on YouTube. He does a lot of things, canoeing and hiking, and he has a whole YouTube video on how to make a cozy, and it's called How to Make a Pot Cozy by Kevin Outdoors. You should check it out. It was really great. Uh, it worked wonderful for us. I'm gonna use it for some other things on my next trips. So here's my stove that I talked about, the Snow Peak Gigapower 2.0. I like how small it is, how efficient it is, and the fact that it uses butane gas, the canisters, that is. I take three stoves when I go with six to nine people. I only usually bring two stoves when I have like four people. So I also own some jet boils, and I do bring those with, although I didn't this year. But jet boils are great, the water gets really fast, uh, hot really, really fast so that if people want coffee right away, you can do that. It also uses canisters, so it's really um, a nice combination to have. There are actually three sizes of canisters. Here are the two sizes that I bring. There are the, it's shows, showing you here the eight ounce and the 16 ounce versions. I think the four ounce, ounce version is a little too small for my groups, but it'd be really great for one or two people. I also bring this crunch it tool, which punches a hole into the canister when it's empty. It just makes sure that all the gas is out. I think it's a really good thing to have. Jetboil sells it. 
So just to let you know, each eight ounce can of butane will burn approximately two hours on high heat and four hours at simmer. And here is my GSI Outdoors Pinnacle Camper Cook Set. I actually got this about four or five years ago. Some friends brought theirs on a canoe trip and I just fell in love with it. Now, this is for four people. They actually have one for two people. GSI stands for Incredible Gear, Inspired Solutions, and Never Ending Innovations. This kit includes, as you can see on the table there, two pots, two lids, a frying pan, four plates, four bowls, four cups which fit into the bowls. They have a lid also, one pot gripper, and the case can actually double as a wash pan. They also, um, they also have a set for two people. And I love the lid. You see on the lower left side there that there's actually vents for the steam to come out of. You just wanna make sure that when you put your lid on, it's opposite of your handle. So here's a little video showing you how to put it together. Everything fits in so nicely. I put the pot gripper inside one of the cups and there you go. Since I go a lot with eight or nine people, I actually have two of these. So here is my pot on the stove and I want to tell you that it's made out of titanium. So you do not wanna put this on a wood fire. These Pots and pans are made specifically for camping stoves. You're not supposed to use them on your stove in your house, not supposed to put them in the oven. They're specifically made for camping stoves. And so they're really great in that way. You don't wanna put this on a wood fire. The only thing that I put on my wood fire is the griddle that I bring to cook fish and pancakes and quesadillas and things like that. On the right slide here, right picture is my latest GSI find. It's a gourmet knife and cutting board set. It only comes with one cutting board, but I, I got one more and I snuck it in there. It's really great. Everyone loved it. So lunch. So lunch is basically make your own out of all that's on the plastic on the tablecloth there. Pita bread and tuna fish are the best lunch we, we've come up with in years. A lot of people will actually put snap peas and carrots and cheese in their pita bread with their tuna fish. And it's really a luxurious sandwich. I buy mayonnaise packets at the deli. You could also buy some mustard. And we bring lots of crackers and cheese and jerky and beef sticks. We really like the carrots and snap peas and radishes for fresh vegetables in the, in the beginning of the week. And an in-camp lunch, you could also have soup. And we've also done bagels and cream cheese with salmon in the foil that you find at the grocery store. That's a really good lunch too. So here's a picture of a bunch of the tuna fishes and the chicken. And I just want to let you know that chicken and foil is pretty hard to find these days in a grocery store. I've only been able to order it online for the last three years. So order it online if you really like it. It's really good and don't try to dehydrate it. It's really bad. So look at all those different tuna fishes you can have. You have the regular one that we bring. You could also bring a buffalo style, sweet and spicy, and zesty lemon pepper style. And on the lower left part of the slide here, I have, I'm showing the Idahoan mashed potato series, and they are really great. We have used those before. They're really good. And then there's Spam in foil. So for those of you that still like spam and you miss it, it's in foil. So you can go get it at the store and bring it with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 30 and 60 liter barrels for food storage because a lot of people have these and some people don't. And I've had those, I've had both sizes for many, many years now. The 60 liter is pictured on the dock here, and it's about the same size as some of the other, your other packs. It can get a bit heavy if you put a lot of heavy food into, in it or some liquids. So I tend to bring that if I have a lot of men on my trips. The 30 liter is smaller, and I specifically use it for lunch. We put everything that's for lunch in that pack. And that's really nice because then it's so easy to, to grab for day trips. So we'll hang our food pack at camp and leave that there and then bring the smaller 30 liter 
barrel for lunch and it works out really great. Be sure and get a good harness. Now notice the harness on my smaller barrel is really padded. It's really nice. There's different kinds. So be sure and check that out pretty carefully. They're technically not bear proof, but I still feel pretty safe using them in canoe country. So lunches all in all, be sure and make them so they're easy that you can bring them with you on day trips. Here's a wonderful view from the top of Thunder Point on Knife Lake. I was just there last August, remember, and I met lots of people from all over the country there. Um, we just had a really nice, nice hike up to the beautiful viewpoint. We got into appetizers about 20 years ago. A friend of mine, Russ, brought Asiago cheese and water crackers, and we decided that we wanted to incorporate um, this into our meal planning all the time. So we do this every night. We always have an appetizer. It can be very simple. It could be something like pretzels or quite elaborate like fresh bruschetta, which my friend Diane came up with and now we bring every single year. So here is our first night's appetizer last month. I wanna tell you how I make the fresh bruschetta. I toasted the bread at home and cut it and put it in a Ziploc. I froze the real mozzarella ball. I usually just buy a small one and I brought fresh tomato and shallots, and I brought those whole, and then I diced them on site, and then I had the oil and the red balsamic vinegar separated and added those to the container. I, had, I brought fresh basil from my garden, which we chopped, and then we had some garlic, which we minced, and we mixed it all together, and it was really great. Um, it, and it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, pretty easy, actually, appetizer, a little decadent. So notice the table that I have the wine and the appetizers on. This Helinox table is a really nice small table that folds up really small. It's only about two pounds and it's really, really handy. We use it for hors d'oeuvres, we use it for coffee. You, you can use it for a, a, a lot of reasons. You know, and sometimes you get to camp and you've got this wonderful natural table that you could use, but more often than not, you don't have that. So. I'd say splurge, get one of these Helinox tables. We use them all the time. So let's talk about dinners. Here's our first night dinner on my last trip. We had no name steaks and we cooked potatoes, onions, and broccoli and foil over the fire. I made sauteed mushrooms in a wine sauce in the frying pan on my stove. And then we didn't do a salad that night because we'd had the fresh bruschetta and we were just kind of full, but that's a really nice first night meal. Another night we had chicken quesadillas. So I used the chicken in the foil that I talked about. You mix it with the salsa and then you add cheddar cheese slices and you, do, you spread the chicken and the salsa and layer the cheese on half of the tortilla. And then you fold it over and you would bake both sides. And you, you really don't wanna put one whole tortilla on and then spread everything out and put another one on. You can't really flip it over. Everything just kind of falls out. Believe me, we've tried it. So we've gone to the folding it in half. It works out really, really great. You could cut it in thirds to serve it to people or people can just take out their whole half. And, and if you have enough, you know, there's usually packages of eight or 10 tortillas. So it works out really good if you have eight people. Be sure and use a little oil on the pan before you do this. And the other thing is that this isn't one of those meals that works really well when you, want to, when you have to do it on your stove and frying pan. It works great. So let's talk about pizza. Now there's lots of different ways to make pizza up in the Boundary Waters. And this is the way that we've been making it for about 20 years. We came up with this and I really, really like it. So here's my setup on the left. I have get all of the ingredients ready and then I make the pizza dough. And we buy the pizza dough in the bags that are like a dollar and all you have to do is add half of a cup of hot water. And so we keep them individual and I also use disposable pans so we get those ready. I use two pans for the four or five of us and then it was almost, too much pizza to eat, to eat, but 
we managed to eat most of it. When I have a group of six to nine, we always use three pans. So I'm going to play this video and it's a little fast and it shows you how to make pizza in this manner. I'm gonna play this, but then we're gonna talk about it and play it again so, because it's very, very fast. So here is Kathy and Chris and they put the dough in to the pans, we cooked the crust first. It got brown, then we add the toppings, and then we put the foil back on, and then we cook it for another 10 or 15 minutes, and then it was done. So, I just wanna say that, while well, that was all, took 16 seconds, that actually took about an hour. So it takes a while, but it's really, really good. So you wanna have your fire ready so someone can be doing the fire while everybody else might be doing the ingredients and then someone's making the pizza dough and you have to let that pizza dough rest for about five minutes after you mix it up. Then you wanna oil the pans and then you wanna to, want to spread the dough and then you wanna to, want to place heavy duty aluminum foil over the sides and fold them down over the sides and then put it on the fire. And you want to keep that on the fire for 10 to 15 minutes until the crust gets brown. This also means that you might have to move the pans around. You might be, they might be like this. You might wanna move them like this. You keep moving them around so that they don't get black. If you get any flames in your fire, you wanna actually put, it, put them out with a little bit of water. But you also wanna have some tinder that you can put in the fire to keep it going. So we're going to show the video again and you can see what I was talking about. So here they're spreading out the crust, we're cooking the crust. Now we're putting the sauce and the ingredients and the cheese on and I actually used a little leftover bruschetta and the mozzarella cheese on these pizzas and that really gave it a lot of flavor. So cut it into as many pieces as you need and it's a great, great way to do that. So we always usually have spaghetti also on our trips, it's a great, meal to have at the end of the trip because it's a stove meal so it's pretty easy to do at any time. I use one pot for the spaghetti and I always try to use angel hair because that cooks a lot faster and one pot for the sauce. I used a packet of dry spaghetti sauce. I added the vacuum sealed tomato paste and some water and then the rehydrated hamburger and we brought some grated parmesan cheese to put on the top and we like to use the cabbage salad with our spaghetti because cabbage lasts a lot longer. So it's, we tend to use it towards the end of our trip. While we didn't have any fish on this trip, we were skunked. I always bring shore lunch and a little flour and some oil to cook the fish. And here's my son, Michael, on Saganagans Lake in the Quetico with lots of fresh walleye. You can cook it on the in the frying pan or you can cook it over the fire. If you have a large group of people, frying fish on the griddle allows you to cook a lot more fish at a, at a time. And remember those hash browns I talked about? Well, you could do those on the griddle too. So I would cook the hash browns first and then put those in another pot or wrap them in aluminum foil to keep them warm and then cook your fish and you have a great meal. Everyone I go with on canoe trips loves salads. So we usually have them the first three to four nights of a trip. If we're on a week long trip, we probably don't have them, although cabbage could last five or six days. So I have started buying the smaller bags of salads that are out there now that have the more shredded lettuce and the kale and the cabbage in them. And then there's lots of dressing choices. They are really, really good. Now, the biggest thing about bringing salads is that you want to keep your food pack in the shade. So just keep moving it around. You know, the sun moves around from one side to the other and your, your camp, um, the shade might be there in the morning, but it won't be there in the afternoon. So just keep, change, keep changing it around so you keep it in the shade and it really helps with your cheeses and your salads and things like that. Pre-made soups are really handy to have on hand and there's lots of brands out there. I tend to use the Bear Creek brand. Now in this picture, it's showing you chicken noodle soup with bisquick dumplings. So what I do is I put bisquick in a Ziploc at home. And then when we're in camp, I add filtered water enough to make it kind of knead it and make it kind of like 
a uh, little doughy. I snip the end of the Ziploc and I've got the soup in the pot already and it's all mixed, but you might have to add a little more water if you're going to do dumplings. And you squeeze the dumplings into the soup and then you put the cover on and you simmer it for about 10 to 15 minutes. And it's a great way to have a chicken noodle soup. You can also buy a potato soup and you could make, add some cooked wild rice and some um, chicken and foil for a creamy wild rice chicken soup. That's a really easy thing to do. So notice in the picture, there's also the Asian cabbage salad. And so the way we make that is we use that chicken ramen noodle soup mix. So we use the ramen noodles, we crunch them up, we cut onions, we add sesame seeds, and then we make a dressing with the chicken packet, seasoning packet, and mix that with oil and vinegar. And oh my gosh, it's really, really good. So we probably buy a head like this when there's eight of us and we can get three meals out of that. So then you would buy, you know, three ramen noodle soup mixes, bring enough onion, maybe one big onion and you cut it into three. I'm, like, I'm say, like I've been saying all along, cabbage is a great, great salad to have up there. It lasts really long. Um, it's just a really great thing. So now I'm going to play for you a video and this is by Kate, who owns Brim Restaurant in Minneapolis. And she's going to show us how she cooks some campfire packets over the fire. Now, I first want to, I just want to tell you a little side story here. I first met Kate through my son, Michael, who went to college with her brother, whose name is also Michael. So, and another side note, they also both surf on Lake Superior. They're still friends. So Kate is the co-owner of Brim, like I said, and their food truck was next to the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness uh, booth last year at the State Fair. And so we got to get reacquainted. It was so much fun to see her and her parents there. So let's watch her video. Hi, I'm Kate Sadoti. I'm the chef at Brim Restaurant in Uptown and we are cooking uh, an easy outdoor meal with the Friends of the Boundary Waters. And tonight we're in the Split Rock campground and we're making campfire packets. We're using potatoes, fresh potatoes, and fresh Minnesota carrots. It's kind of easy pockets you can make over the fire. We're using potatoes and then we're topping them with rosemary, like a whole sprig, nice and woody. And then the carrots, we're using some parsley and dill. So you pop those in there, you drizzle it with a little bit of olive oil, sea salt, pepper, your herbs, and then this is where you'd add your chicken or fish, um, wrap it up in parchment, finish it with the tin foil. Helps to kind of double layer it. And then, Popping this over the fire for about 30, 45 minutes, not too long. So just a campfire, some fresh veggies, tons of herbs, chicken or fish, and that's dinner. Doesn't that look delicious? Thanks, Kate. Um, that's a really nice way to show us how we can put lots of different things in the foil packets. And I love the fact that you use the parchment paper. I'm gonna try that the next time I do it also. Well, let's move on to desserts. What can I say about desserts? I mean, there's so many choices, there's so many bars, there's so many, and the chocolate especially. I'm sure you have your favorites and there's lots of easy things. You can make pudding, you could do s'mores. It's Desserts are a lot of fun. The possibilities are endless. But I kind of actually upped my game a few years ago. I found this lightweight Dutch oven in Duluth, and I have been cooking with that um, for many years. I've made cakes, I've made brownies, I've made scones and cornbread. It requires wood, coals, and a little bit of patience, but it's really, oh, it's really, really worth it. And so on our trip in August, I made scones for dessert one night, and since there was only four of us, we had the other half for breakfast the next day. And that was really fun. You know, if you're base camping, 
a lot of people are worried about weight, but bringing a Dutch oven is not a bad idea. You know, there's a lot of one pot meals out there that you can make for a large group. And so I would say, you know, try thinking about doing some Dutch oven cooking. It's, it's really fun. You could do desserts like this, or you could do one pot meals. And uh, so I've kind of decided, you know, do I want a cliff bar or do I want chocolate cake or scones? And, you know, I do a little bit of both. So one more thing we we're going to talk about is that some people really like to add some flavor into their water. They just don't want to drink lake water. But so we found, I found recently that Mio is a brand that is really nice. It's convenient, it's small, there's lots of flavors, and just one squeeze into your water bottle and you have a really tasty drink. There's many brands out there. There are Kool-Aid has a squeezable brand and also Crystal Light has a squeezable brand now. You may not believe this, but many, many years ago on my first trip, we actually brought a 10 pound bag of sugar and Kool-Aid because we were desperate to drink Kool-Aid and that's all you could do back then. And I just uh, want to talk a little bit more about coffee. Don't forget to buy ground coffee. So one time I forgot to bring ground coffee. I bought the whole bean and we didn't realize it till the first morning. We put it in a Ziploc and then we pounded it with the back part of our hatchet and we called it axed ground coffee. I'm going to leave you with a picture of an, a beautiful August morning on Knife Lake. We're looking east here. Thanks for listening. And I hope you can use some of these suggestions either this fall or next summer. You can certainly email me later if you have any questions about anything. I'm up for answering questions about food and about trips. Well, thank you, Kim. Really appreciate it. But before we get to questions, um, we have a couple things to cover. Most importantly, we actually have something to give away. A little special something for all of our viewers stopped by and joined us tonight. Uh, parchment paper and foil. Why did none of us ever do that? <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, okay. I gotta, I also have to find a special order some chicken things to bring with too. Like that's also a thing for Kim. Uh, yeah. Kim, what are we giving away tonight? Well, I made a tote bag made out of green canvas and I put the Friends of the Boundary Waters patch on the new patch. So uh, we have that. And then I make jewelry. I make hand painted earrings. And this is called my Lakes and Woods series. It's blues and greens. So we're giving this away to the lucky person that registered for the presentation tonight. And that would be Mike. We have Steph Fear, which is F-I-E-R, that uh, we're going to get a hold of her. We have her email. We have her contact info. And we'll get that out to you, uh, to you Steph. Thank you for, for signing up and joining us tonight. Uh, appreciate it. And I've seen these before. We've had one at an annual gathering, and they're wonderful. So without further ado, we're going to have a quick questions and a few here. So think through them. But before we get there, we have to always mention um, we're able to continue our protection work. Able to keep continuing sending kids up there and our restoration work to you. You're the reason the Friends of Boundary Waters exist. You're the reason we're able to continue to do these things. If you like what you heard tonight, you know, shop by our website. Stop by friends-boundarywaters.org backslash donate and you add yourself to a membership. You get our newsletter, which has wonderful stories, which Kim sometimes writes for, which is always fun, um, you know, four times a year. And we have updates on what we're up to, how we're working on things to really maintain this wonderful place. So tomorrow morning session, um, we'll talk about a, in a few, but let's get to questions real quick. Um, I've got one right off the top, Kim, and that is, how heavy is your griddle? Well, <laughs> um, it's an aluminum griddle, and I would say that it probably weighs mm, one to two pounds. One friend does not like me to bring it, but I like to bring it because it's just a little bit thicker and it really holds the heat well. So I, uh, I love to bring the griddle. I know there's some more lightweight ones out there that have the Teflon coating, and I have one of those, and sometimes I bring that, but I really like this aluminum one. Heavy, heavy duty aluminum. Thanks, Robin, for the question there. Uh, we have a question over here, Kim, on 
What about larger groups? You know, is there anything you'd recommend differently or that might change food prep or food preparation to maybe when you have an eight or nine person group that maybe you'd recommend? Well, a lot of times you just have to bring two of everything when you have that many people. And so, you know, when you're bringing spaghetti, if you have a lot of people, a lot of men, you might have to bring two pounds of spaghetti instead of one pound of spaghetti. So a lot of times you just, you have to look at it and think, I'm going to double this recipe or, and then if you have a little bit of leftover, that's fine because sometimes you can eat that for lunch the next day or you just don't prepare everything that you've brought with you, but it's always good. I've learned to have a little bit more than not enough. Know that fully and nobody likes running out of food. No. Um, we have, um, how do you deal with cleaning? Um, how do you do it organized for a bigger group? Do you clean and also clean up or how do you divvy that up between different people in your group? So cleaning up, you mean washing the dishes and things like that? Yeah, I mean, you, you have a process, but you know. It, oh, sure. You know, we just kind of always take turns. Um, most of the time, the people I go with, they all fight to wash the dishes and clean up because they want to get their hands washed and cleaned. But, you know, it's really important to get everything really clean as soon as you can right afterwards so that the animals don't come in. And... Um, so I, we don't really have a caper chart, but we, we kind of take note and we all try to take our turns doing that. If someone cooks the meal, then usually they don't clean up. So I don't cook the meal every time. And so that's another way to do it. Whoever cooks doesn't have to clean up. So we kind of do it that way. Gotcha. Well, thanks. This is the other question. A uh, question on salads. Kim, how do you prevent them from getting too wilty or too, you know, slimy on your trip? Well, so when I go to the grocery store, I try to buy the, the, the ones that have the date that are the furthest ones out. And then, so I've stopped buying the lettuce only salads. Mm -hmm. There's the new ones that are about, they're smaller, they're narrower, and they have, it's cut finer, the lettuce and the cabbage, and there's kale and then they have the seeds and like cranberries and another little packet and then the dressing. And those, you know, there's Asian ones, there's Southwest ones, there's all mm -hmm. these different flavors now. Those seem to keep better, that way better than just lettuce only. When we did lettuce only packets, we had to have those like the first night, maybe not even make it to the second night. Right. But the other ones with it are, they have the cabbage and the kale in them and oh my gosh those last longer and especially if you keep them in the shade that's that's a great pro tip i've seen those they are tasty they are uh, all right so we have we have time for about one or two more questions um we have one in here from uh, deborah uh that uh, she used to use sand by the shoreline to help clean pots both pots and pans that shouldn't have sand you no you're not supposed to do that anymore them. what do you mean yeah, yeah indeed so you're not supposed to clean your dishes in the lake anymore I know that people used to do that many, many years ago. But what you're supposed to do is we bring a camp soap along. And so we have, a, we either use our two pots or you bring a little dish pan to do your dishes in and you do it away from the lake. And so I use as hot of water as I can stand for washing the dishes and really hot water for rinsing. And I actually put some bleach in the, in the rinse water. We wash our dishes. Then we take the water and we go back into the woods and we dump it in the woods, try to find a hole to dump it in. You go back as far as you can. You want to keep the soap and any food particles out of the lake. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's great. All right, so that's that's what we have for here. Kim, thank you again for, for helping us out here. I learned a bunch of things too, and I've been in dress rehearsals. It's wonderful. Well, um, thanks for asking me, and I hope everyone had a good time tonight and learned something. And again, give me, send me, a, shoot me an email, email if you'd like to know anything more. And I also talk a lot about routes with people and stuff like that, so. Very, always able to help the cause. So for folks, for the rest of the tomorrow, tomorrow morning session, uh, we're on lunchtime, it's about climate change and the Boundary Waters. And that's from actually a former board member, it's director of the U of M Center for Forest Ecology, Professor Lee Freelich. And we'll have a little intro by our former Fond du Lac band chairwoman, Karen Diver, and that'll be sponsored by Dick Flint and Dave Klein.
thank you everybody for coming tonight. Have a wonderful evening and we'll have this up on the website soon so you can refer to some of Kim's great tips here. Thanks again and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.